Another day, another SCP monster list. I'm starting to think of SCPs in terms of Pokemon logic. You gotta catch them all. Wouldn't that make a great app? You know, The Foundation Go? They've done it for a bunch of other IPs, why not SCPs? Make it happen, internet. They're even conveniently numbered already. The parallels are unparalleled, although there are only like 800 total Pokemon and, well, more than 5,000 SCPs, so it'd be a little harder to do. But, you know, maybe just Series 1 or something, and only the monsters, none of the items. But now I'm just rambling about my million dollar idea. Bringing it back in, there are so many terrifying SCPs to discuss. I'm always thrilled to take another dive into the archives and find out some new stuff. The lore deepens with each visit, and I honestly never imagined I would understand so much of the assorted SCP canons. So today, I bring you a new offering of creepy crawlies that you'd be best to to stay far, far away from. Hello, horror heads, and welcome back to the scariest channel on YouTube, Top 5 Scary Videos. I'm your horror host, Keegan Hughes, and today we're bringing you part 7 of our Top 5 SCP Monsters That Can Never Escape series. Lucky you. Before we get started, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more SCP insanity. Wicked. Let's do it. Starting us off at number 5, SCP-525. Name 5 things you would never want in your eye sockets. Needles, dirt, hydrochloric acid, hot coffee, anything that isn't your own personal eyeball. Okay, well, what about spiders? Eye spiders. Spiders. Oh boy. That's what SCP-525 is. It's a bunch of spider legs that want to come together and steal your eyes. So actually, it's a collection of multiple disjointed anthropod legs around 10 to 15 centimeters in length. DNA tests have been inconclusive, but it seems like these spindly limbs are closest to those of a brown recluse. At the base of each leg are several minute hooks capable of perforating flesh. Ah, perforated flesh. It makes me think of the days where I thought everything sounded like a wicked band name. Well, actually, that would be a good song name, but I digress. When these legs are left alone, they remain motionless. However, if eight of them are brought within 0.6 meters of each other, they will bunch up into a group and attach themselves into a single entity. We'll call this one 525-1. Once a makeshift spider is formed, this eight-legged freak will crawl around and try to make contact with the closest human or similar. I say similar because they only respond to most large to moderate sized mammals, and even then, not everything is attractive to them. Once it finds a suitable eyeball producer, the spider will crawl up to the sockets. It'll center itself over the eye and use four legs to secure the eyelid while the other four extract the eye. This is done with surgical precision and 525 will take extreme care as to not damage the eye. Optic nerves are severed and the central retinal vein is sliced. It's all very meticulous. Once the eye is free, 525 will implant the base of each leg into the eye and if allowed to remain, the spider will lay some eggs in the host's eye socket. Nightmarish. These will eventually sprout into new spider legs which will then go hunting for more eyeballs. After about three weeks, the eye out in the world will dehydrate and the legs will leave to find another. Keep your safety goggles on and maybe consider investing in a space helmet unless you want the ocular arachnids coming by and snatching your sight orbs. Coming in at number 4, we have SCP-4165. Is anyone in the audience a tortured artist? Like, do you get an idea and you make it and it doesn't turn out how you wanted it to? And then you feel bad and the failure torments you? It looms like a dark inky shadow in your mind following you around as you attempt to live a normal life? I'm definitely not speaking from experience here, no way. I'm just trying to make a connection between you and the SCP we're about to discuss. SCP-4165 is a 28-year-old human male in pretty rough physical condition. Lots of minor health problems here, but all of that is not anomalous. The real abnormality is the ink monster that manifests and chases him. We'll call this dark blobular humanoid. 4165-1 has the ability to change its shape, size, and physical state at will. It will typically manifest around 50 meters away from 4165 and move towards it, avoiding any existing obstacles. No interest will be shown in other individuals unless it's attacked or otherwise provoked. If this is the case, it will harden its extremities and use them as weapons or attempt to fill the assailant's mouth and nose with ink. Not nearly as tasty as squidding pasta, unfortunately. If 4165-1 is immobilized or significantly harmed, it will demanifest and then wait around 7-10 to 10 days before showing up again. A nice week off for our poor 4165. Coming back to the question I posed at the beginning of this entry, there is one instance of the ink monster getting close enough to kill 4165. It has never actually killed him though, and instead if it gets nice and close, it'll pull a notebook and black pen from a hole in its head. This will greatly distress 4165 and often cause a panic attack. If the book and pen are not accepted and used, the beast will savagely beat 4165. It's like writer's block manifesting and then kicking your ass. Like, oh, write the book, you idiot. Oh, who told you? You, you went out and told everyone that you were going to do it. Now they think you're a hack. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's existentially and creatively terrifying. 
Coming in at number three, SCP-4064. Maybe some of you folks at home would want to meet one of these SCPs. Sometimes it takes a little confidence boost and then a heartbreak for you to get your life back on track. No judgment. 4064 is a hive mind capable of inhabiting six distinct bodies, each of which appear as a light-skinned human woman with a golden face mask. These instances are able to interact with their masks on a biological level, sharing neuron impulses with each other and often perceiving their surroundings simultaneously. Persuasion also becomes more effective while wearing the masks. The goal of the six individuals is to serve a deity known as Anatolia. They all claim to be the daughters of Anatolia who need to nourish their goddess through the collection of strong negative emotion. The gold mask wearing sextet are known as the sisters, one of the multiple subgroups of the daughters. Sisters collect anguish and go around forcing people to fall in love with them before breaking their hearts. The emotional ruin of the men they seduce is delicious food for their goddess. The foundation was able to secure and contain two instances of the sisters and from various interviews they were able to find out about two more subgroups, the Matrons and the Pipers. Matrons nourish Anatolia with torture and fear while the Pipers murder innocent people to collect pure mourning. The sorrow at the passing of a loved one is considered the highest quality food for the goddess. I'll take the breakup, thank you very much. I mean, maybe it'll inspire SCP-4165 to start writing again. Filling out a number two slot, SCP-2030. Be careful what you're binging out there, folks. If you don't check the titles closely, who knows what you'll end up watching. SCP-2030 is an anomalous phenomenon that manifests as a television series. The medium through which it manifests changes with the times. Right now, it most often appears on streaming services, while in the past, it may have showed up as a DVD or a VHS. There's no reliable evidence of it manifesting before 1993, but there are 38 seasons of programming, which implies that it has been active to some degree since about 19. 1976. The program's title typically appears as Laugh is Fun, but other variations have been observed like Laugh is Life and Laugh is Laugh. It will often mimic art from other TV series, often causing viewers to watch it by mistake, thinking they're about to watch something less inherently dangerous. Laugh is Fun is a hidden camera comedy series along the lines of Just for Laughs gags or Candid Camera. However, the goofs and gaffs being pulled are often strange, violent, and disturbing. Some examples of the pranks I'm talking about would be a husband is skinned alive and stuffed with squirrels and then left beside his wife in bed, or a Margaret Thatcher meat monster falls out of the cupboard and attacks a woman in her kitchen. Individuals subjected to these practical jokes will often react with panic or distress, but as soon as the host of the TV show appears, they become immediately calm. The host, or SCP-2030-1, appears invariably in a three-piece suit with black and white wingtip shoes. Is always shot from the neck down, making identification difficult. Most participants will express familiarity with the host and often identify him by his known name, Laffy McLafferson. Mm -hmm. Laffy will always give an odd speech at the end of each episode, and it sums up what we saw in a way that would seem to be like aliens wrote it if they wanted to like mimic human entertainment from the 70s. Not quite word salad level, but definitely in like the uncanny valley of speech, if that's a thing. All participants on the show are real, recognizable humans, and every last one of them has died of causes unrelated to the show. There is nothing connecting their deaths to the show other than the footage of them on the show. Laugh is fun. Laugh is laugh. And at number one, we have SCP-4205. What are your windows made of? Do you know the particular variety of glass? Maybe find out, or just stop looking at them. Why? because you might accidentally catch a glimpse of 4205. This is a visually perceived cognitohazardous anomaly presenting as two adjacent amber-hued luminous oculiform objects within a transparent medium, or in layman's terms, amber eyes appearing in glass. It has been observed in all sorts of glass, the only exception being lead glass. Any sentient being directly viewing 4205 will undergo immediate and irreversible brain death, with all measurable neurological activity ceasing within 500 milliseconds of exposure. It 100% instantly kills people that look at it. An outside observer would see the individual just drop dead. However, for the person dying, the half second interval it would take to die would seem like it was taking forever. This is stretched out in their perception as the eyes seem to enjoy tormenting people. Yikes. All you did was look out the window and now you're experiencing unimaginable torture and regret. Bad deal. Should have kept your eyes on the screen. Viewing footage of the eyes is safe, but any digital footage will display some level of corruption. And the foundation terminal that had been used during a viewing event was later found with severe textual and data corruption. The entry for this one is very interesting. It actually mimics the experience of using a 90s era foundation terminal, so I would highly recommend checking this one out in its entirety. Poor Wade. So self-conscious, so self-critical, but hey, happens to the best of us. 
All right, another five for you to fret over for the next week or so. What did you think? Have you heard of any of these before? Which SCP do you want to see on the next list? Make sure you let me know down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's peruse some of your more persnickety ones from last time. Steven Osborne, along with a whole lot of other people said, the thing isn't a remake, it's a prequel. You guys are very passionate about the 2011 remake slash prequel delineation. I mean, it shares the same name and a bunch of plot points, but also, fairly, it is the lead up to the Carpenter version, so I would say that that both classifications apply. Chameleon Boy says, sad how they pull a psycho type reboot again with the Lion King and somehow made tons of money. Yeah, it's weird how brand loyalty can make that happen, eh? Gus Van Sant walked so John Favreau could run. Spy Bunny says, what's with the inhaling before every sentence? So distracting. <sighs> People tend to need to breathe in order to speak, but I'll work on that for you. Keep me posted on your oxygen studies. Max Gonzalez says, You mean the thing from 1982 has Kurt Russell, right? Right? Yes, I apologize for that typographical error. I wrote 1986 when it was obviously supposed to be 1982. Here's a joke about a typographical error. A man calls out to the waiter and says, Excuse me, sir, there's a needle in my soup. To which the waiter replies, My apologies, sir, that was a typographical error. It was obviously supposed to be a noodle, not a needle. And Enkidu Gami Crane says, Jacob's Ladder remake was very disappointing. And I've heard that, but I haven't got around to seeing it yet. I'll add it to my list of stuff to watch when I want to feel really upset with the world. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.